we've spoken quite a bit in this class about different examples of things. We've talked about soils, talked about um, different elements of wetlands. We've talked about um, some approaches people have, that I or other people have taken to restoring wetlands. What I want to do today is make sure we, we have the proper overview context and how we would go about doing a restoration. Granted, we're, this isn't our design and construction class, but still, what's the, how are we going to go do this restoration? So, um, so let me ask you guys, how do, so starting from zero, why don't you guys see if you could run me through the steps of what you think you would do to restore a system? Okay, so, so look up some historical evidence maybe and see what, what in background information is there about the site, what it used to be, that kind of stuff. Geography and stuff, geology. Okay, so maybe that includes soils, maybe that includes, um, you know, uh, that, that type of stuff, physical layout. Okay, good. Surrounding activity around the site, so things like cities or... Okay, the landscape context, so... Um, so do we have a healthy river flowing into the site, or is it a polluted river? Is it, is it a lot of cement concrete around the uh, site, or is it you know, native grassland around the site? Okay, what are some other things you guys would? Plants and animals, like plants, like the plants that are in the system. Okay, so a current characterization of the system, a current assessment of the system, what does it look like right now? Okay, good. Climate. And what context climate? Um, what kind of climate might be there? Like, does it rain all the time? More back to the physical. Okay, okay, sure. I, I would put that in with the other stuff, but okay, yeah, good. Yeah, so current conditions, essentially. <laughs> Can we restore to its historic um, ecology, or would a different ecology be better? Okay, so I think uh, Daniel's think, talking there about... Um, Maybe some pro some projections of future, maybe rainfall, future sea level rise, future whatever, to sort of see is this is this system that maybe needs a lot of rain, and if we forecast that there isn't going to be much rain, is that you know hmm, maybe we need to rethink that. Okay, good. Okay, so reference sites, and why do we care about reference sites? Right. So they they act as a as a ruler for us, right? They act as as um, one, both a target of what we might want wanting to be shoot, wanting to be shooting for, but then also it's a way to compare: are we are we achieving that uh, level of performance? Okay, good. Assessing what's wrong. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So 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 we do an assessment, and assuming something is not ideal, is there a clear driver or drivers that are that are causing there to be, I don't know, no animals or no plants or whatever the case is. So yeah, so, so, so stressors or constraints. Yeah, good. Soil content. Good, soil, absolutely. So soil is part of that initial assessment and that geology and stuff, good. Um, maybe some like public input or like people who live around there. Ah, stuff. excellent. So everything so far we've talked about the, the natural world. So Andy's talking about the issue of the people that live around the wetland maybe, or the residents that would come recreate there, or, or you know, the human side of things. So yeah, very important, good. What else? Is it cost effective to fix? Sure, so doing some budget analysis, of course. So in theory, everything is fixable if you all have a gazillion billion dollars, right? But we rarely have a gazillion billion dollars and uh, I think it's fair to say, look on in the future, we're going to have even less, at least in the, in the short term, for such activities uh, as this. So, so yeah, so if, if uh, we really, really need to move the river to make this site work, and moving the river is going to cost, who knows, I don't know, $30 million. If there's no shot at getting $30 million, even the long shot, it's probably not worth making a plan that involves moving the river, right? It's, it's just unrealistic. So, so at least early on, some kind of gross estimates of what the cost would be or, or um, what, would be in, in, what would be entailed in a full restoration is absolutely important. Other thoughts? Assessing the scope if it's going to actually be a restoration or if it's going to be more of a remediation. Right, good. So, so you know, how intent, how much, um, you know, what, is, what is the goal here? How intensive are we going to do this? Excellent. 
making a plan. Absolutely need a, absolutely need a plan, totally. Other thoughts? Test sites. Test sites, cool. Government approval, right. So, so I, I have a few examples here, and other, this is just, this is very high level. There's many, we could spend, you know, a day on each of these sections, but I just want to make sure you guys had this uh, general overview, right? So good. So all those things you guys said um, are generally right on. So this is, uh, in my experience, for doing uh, wetland restoration projects, these are, the, these are the general phases we go through, the steps we'd go through. As you guys said, so the first would be getting, collecting whatever studies have already been done, the low-hanging fruit. Hey, let's do a literature search, let's search the, the newspapers, let's talk to local universities, let's talk to local consulting firms, county government, that kind of stuff, and see what has been done. And this is, this is a non-trivial step. It's met, in the case of conservation applied things, especially in the case of restoration, only a small fraction of the studies will be in the peer-reviewed literature. And for that matter, only a fraction will actually be findable easily, um, necessarily, by using Google. So almost in almost every case, you have to go talk to people. You have to go physically look in the archives. You have to go call different groups and ask them, hey, do you guys, is anybody ever, they may do an assessment because so much of this activity is done by, the, by consultants and they don't typically publish their work or if they write a report, they write a report and they give it to the government agency and it goes in their vaults and it's not necessarily a public document. Sometimes it is. On the largest, highest profile ones, sure. But more often than not, it's just in somebody's file drawer somewhere. So you need to hunt that down. So, and, and so that, that includes you know, actual detailed focal assessments of the site but also it includes other things like, as you guys were mentioning, um, say just general old maps and general lay of the land and that, that level of stuff, which, is, uh, which are data sources that are out there, but they're maybe not specifically oriented to restoration, but nevertheless we can use them in our restoration planning. So the first thing would be to gather whatever information we can that's already out there. Um, and then very early on, I would say, is time now some of these steps might shift around slightly depending on the site that we're talking about but public engagement really really key early and often talk to folks again you don't want to talk to folks before you've started to gather some background data you want to and you want to have visited the site at least you know a couple times and get a sense but in engaging with the community as early as possible is central then they're going to be in they're, they're, they're going to have buy-in and I don't just mean buy-in in the sense that you know they won't sue you but actually get them involved right now and some some people would argue that's a bad thing that public don't know what's going on and they're stupid and they're ignorant and da, 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 da. but that's not been my experience in all these projects where I've worked even in some place like Turkey where people don't know anything about wetlands or, or know virtually nothing about wetlands um, even those folks they had useful suggestions and were very quick learners and, and got, the con got the idea of what we're doing. So, so the notion that people are too uh, politically oriented one way or intellectually too flawed or whatever, in my experience, is totally false. And that's the wrong way to think about it. So involve people early. Back in the old days, I would say maybe some of my older professors maybe would say, don't do this because these people get involved and lead you down a the incorrect path, or they'll want to do something that's not really, they'll want you to make a bunch of, you know, warm fuzzies and things with pretty <laughs> eyes and stuff. And then, the, and, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's not really, um, or that rarely, if ever, is the case. And, and the benefits from engaging with the public early are tremendous. So we want to engage with the public. And, and not just the public, but, but all the stakeholders. And then, as you guys said, so now we have some background information. Now we are hearing the concerns. What do people want? Do people want to recreate here? Do they want to bird watch here? Do they want this area to protect their farmland? You know, what's, what's the, you know, what are their concerns? We can take all that and uh, 
and maybe this and maybe this is going to come after some side assessments and stuff. But still, then we want to have very clear goals, very specific targets. One of the historic problems with restoration is we have these very lofty goals, these very general generic goals that sound great. We want to have a place with high biodiversity. We want to have a place that has high hydrologic function. You know, that's pretty much baloney in my opinion. That, I mean, it's, it's not baloney in the sense that you, you need to say that, but having something that's so generic as to not be specifically guiding you what to do, that's a problem. And that is what allows us to have um, non-rigorous performance assessments and all that other stuff. Many times we have overly generic goals, overly generic and, and no specific targets because people are afraid, right? People are afraid. They know this is hard and they don't want people to come back and look at them and say, you failed. So they say, we want to make it better. And they leave it at that. So that's, that's the technical term for that is cover your ass. <laughs> if things are getting way too serious, the challenges are way too legion for us to keep doing that silly practice. And uh, you may well fail. You may well fail. And in this business, you have to be, you have to be okay with that, right? I mean, not okay in the sense of, of okay, I failed. But understand that we have, it's a very difficult process to reassemble ecosystems. And so um, don't, so, so say that. Say that in your, in your charge document. We understand that recovering this coastal ecosystem is a very difficult endeavor. And there's a, a strong chance of failure, period. Nevertheless, we would consider a success, you know, A, B, C, D, those goals. They'll, they'll only help you in the long run. Um, the next phase, as you guys touched on, so once we, once we kind of know what the conditions are, once we know what the people want, and we've, we've, we've had this process, the next thing is, um, as Hayden was saying, essentially, let's get an idea for budget. So in recent years, the way we typically do that is do what we call a 30% design. So we, we uh, do a plan, a sort of quick and dirty plan, if you will, or a, or a um, um, not fully designed plan. So for example, this building, Sierra Hall, that we're in, right? we didn't, start, we didn't start put the bid out until the building was totally designed. So we knew exactly how many floors it would be. We knew uh, not just what the floors would be, we knew what the lighting would be inside each of these rooms. We knew that there would be screens on this door. We knew all that kind of stuff. And then once we had that, then we knew how much you know it would cost and everything, and then we would then we went out to bid it. Before you get to that fully built design, though, we need to get an estimate of how long it'll take. Um, you know, realistically, what can we do, etc. And so that's that typically takes the form of this thirty percent design. So so let's plan out a and the, and it's exactly thirty percent now, but we usually use that that rule that that buzzword. But the idea is. Big, the big elements should be in there. So for example, in this case, in the case of um, uh, this plan for Ormond Beach, we've said, okay, we've decided that we want these landscape elements, this water here, this much grassland, etc. And hey, look, for this, we would need to do this to the water source. We would need to put a boardwalk in. Um, and using a, you know, using a, a rough estimate, how much does coastal prairie cost to restore versus how much does coastal dune cost to restore? You can start to run those numbers and get a ballpark estimate of how much it'll cost. Also in doing this, you, so you, you won't get all the specific things. You won't know, you know that this will be fluorescent lighting, say, inside the room, but you'd know that there was gonna be a lecture hall, you know, a, a, a computer lab in this corner of the building, right? You know that kind of broad strokes level of stuff. And so if we know there's going to be a computer lab here, then sure as heck we better have a compute, um, you know, um, internet cabling going to this room. So okay, right, so that, level of, that level of expectation. Outside we have our, what I originally designed to be a green roof, which they deleted and turned into the planter area that we have now. But still, um, right, that tells us that we have to have water, you know, external water plumbed out there to water those, th that vegetation, et cetera. 
So it's, it's going to give us the big constraints. It's going to tell us how we're going to respond to those big constraints. And it's going to give us a ballpark of the, of the design. And so what we're as, you know, say the full, okay, so I'll give you an example from uh, uh, Camp Park. For Camp Park, when we did this, the full restoration of Camp Park, we're probably talking on the order of maybe, I don't know, it depends on how we do it, but let's call it $6 million. The 30% design cost about 60K, $60,000. So some consultants spent a few months and they, they got they got, they got that together. So the 30% design is not the complete full hardcore design, but it's, it's, the, it's the document that we use to then go get our permits, to then go secure the funding from government agencies or private agencies or whatever. And that funding would first complete the design, take it from 30% to 100%, and provide the money for the guys to drive the tractors and the people to buy the plants and you guys do the monitoring and all that kind of stuff. Cool? Okay, so 30% design. And then of course, associated with this, we have to get all the permits. And, it, and, and not non-trivially, this will tell us what permits we need. And in some cases that, oh yeah, we can go forward with it. Or in some cases, oh my God, we need this permit. These guys are never going to give us this kind of permit. So that might that the end of the 30% design might be the project goes on indefinite hold because of some, it's, oh my God, we did this rough estimate, it's going to be $100 million. There's no way we're going to get $100 million for this. Right. Okay. Um, when we start to actually getting to do the restoration, um, the first thing we need to get right in uh, a wetland context. Now this wouldn't necessarily apply to an alpine meadow necessarily, but when we're talking about wetlands, the very first thing we have to get right is the hydrology. If the hydrology is not right, everything else, it's, it, it doesn't matter. So that could involve you know, changing water inputs, changing water outputs. It could involve the residence time of water in the system. I mean, there's many different ways to do that. But Hydrology is the very first thing. We have a lot of examples from, um, oh, I don't know, Malibu Lagoon, where the hydrology was done by an idiot like me. I, I, didn't, I didn't do that, that hydrology, but, but a biologist, right? Because the biologist cares about the plants. The biologist cares about the endangered birds. So, the, so historically, biologists were, have always been heavily involved with this. And then, okay, well, uh, we'll make the water go in and water go out. No, eh, no, bad. You need an engineer. You need someone that really understands hydro, in many cases. If it's a simple little pond in your backyard, maybe not. But for most significant projects, you need modeling. You need some, uh, and not just ballpark modeling, but, but you know, numerical modeling, quantitative modeling. Uh, a lot of times, spatially explicit, increasingly, we're going to GIS-based um, three-dimensional mapping for for how water moves through these systems, et cetera. So we want to get the hydrology correct. So once we go to do the actual construction, once we go to do the actual manipulation, let's get hydrology correct first. Then, as you guys said, uh, the soils. So we got the water going to come in, going to go out the right way. Cool. Next is, hey, do we have the appropriate substrate upon which these organisms will reside? So if we're doing an offshore reef, do we have the right kind of boulders? If we're doing stuff in this coastal estuary, do we have soils that have a high enough clay content, for example? Uh, usually the next la layer will be to, to work on the vegetation. So we got the water, we got, this, we got the underlying structure, uh, physical structure, the soils, the geology. Um, now let's work on adding the, sed the, the, the stationary life forms. The life forms that we put in, at least initially, don't move around. Their seeds might move around, they might fragment and, and, and you know, colonize elsewhere, but the actual plants don't typically move, unless they're a Venus flytrap or something. So get those guys right. The guy on the left there, you guys that were in um, Law and Policy, that was my friend Jack uh, when we were in grad school. 
Um, and then, only then do we bring in the animals, typically. Then we bring in the butterflies, then we bring in the, the whomever, the caterpillars, the cows, the whatever. Um, and with the idea that first typically bring in the relatively sedentary animals, the ones that either that have a very small home range or don't move very far, and then later on bring in the more mobile um, critters. That's the rough rule of thumb um, as far as adding organisms to the um, to the place. Then after we, we, we after we have those things kind of popping and cracking. As Jayla was saying, then we need to make sure we address the issues of um, material and energy flow in and out of the system more broadly writ. So what the surrounding landscape is like, what the connectivity is like. Connect so uh, landscape, let's say what the pollutant load might be coming into the site from our surrounding areas and maybe that requires us putting in some buffer system between our, say, wetland and the, um, and the upland area. So a more robust transition from wetland to upland. Um, uh, maybe it involves facilitating animal dispersal into terrestrial animal dispersal into this site. So maybe that means doing some, uh, some change fencing around the river uh, that's coming in so that coyotes or whoever can come in or go out or, or that type of thing. So making sure that our parcel, now that we kind of got it starting to rock and roll, is going to well integrate with our surrounding uh, ecosystems. Then, of course, as you guys know, roll on. So we got that. Maybe we got all that. Those those initial first parts of the system up and running. Now we need to work on monitoring and assessment. So okay, now we're going to do our, and it's going to depend monthly, yearly, whatever assessment. And so monitoring is just the collecting of the information. So going out, measuring, counting sampling. The assessment is then looking at that and that's the comparison say to your reference sites you guys were mentioning or or those other um, those, those other performance metrics. So okay we're supposed to have 100 percent of species X. Do we have 100 percent cover of species X? And so uh, so monitoring assessment totally totally key and so often historically completely ignored even today even today in, in we have some fantastic consulting firms doing some great stuff. Once the money runs out, they typically stop. So this is, uh, if I had to pick one major weakness on other than poor performance goals and, and, and clear targets, the next one would be the fact that we don't actually look at these things and don't, don't follow um, the trajectory of these, these systems. And lastly, uh, as far as a growth step, and, and you know, uh, some folks would say that last one, the monitoring assessment, that's not really part of restoration. I would argue it is. Mm -hmm. And other people would say that this is not really part of restoration, but again, I, I would strongly argue that it is, which is um, we're going to screw it up. We're not going to be perfect, right? This isn't, uh, this isn't treating someone for a broken bone where pretty much the doctors know how to treat you for a broken bone and we've been doing it for a long time, right? This is, this is more akin to solving cancer or something like that, right? So, so we're, we might be pretty good at it, but everybody knows we could be doing it better, right? And in some cases, we're really bad at it and we need to get better quickly. In any event, we can always improve what we're doing, either improve the ecological response or do it more cost effectively what have you. There's always innovation to be wrung out of the system. And every single restoration I would encourage you guys to think of as an opportunity to experiment. Whether you explicitly do it as an experiment, which I'd like you to do, um, you should, it should always be a template for you guys to try stuff and, 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 and experiment with procedures, experiment with techniques, experiment with new um, you know, timelines, all that kind of stuff. And so, so innovating and learning is key. Innovating and learning is totally key. And, and we need to be much more explicit about this, that this is, this is part of the process. The process is to learn. Again, funders don't want to hear that. Right? Funders don't want to hear that we're doing an, an experiment. Funders want to hear that you're the expert, you're going to fly on in, you're going to wave your magic wand, do your do for a while or a couple years, and then it's going to be great. 
part of having the public engaged early on in our restorations is so that they understand this. They understand that you're not a bad person, but nobody knows how to fix this bottomland hardwood swamp. Nobody does. And so if they're bought in early to that, but they understand that you think about this a lot, that you spend your life thinking about bottomland hardwood swamp restoration, they're gonna go, okay, cool, you are the expert, but they're also gonna see you as not perfect. And so when we get to the end, they're, they're, they welcome the innovation. What do we learn, right? So yeah, our wetland was better than it was, may, may not be perfect, but it's better than it was. And check it out, we learned A, B, C, and D. That's cool, right, that's cool. And so associated with that last step is this notion of communicating. So we have to talk to the media. Increasingly, that means you guys have to tell your own story the way you would like to tell it. That means via blogs, that means via social media, that means via your professional networks. Historically, this was radically discouraged, right? Historically, we as scientists shouldn't be talking to the media. I never once had a single class as an undergrad, as a graduate student, anything like that about, well, about restoration to begin with, <laughs> to teach myself, but, but more importantly, um, in terms of engaging, again, th this historically, it's not, it's not true, and, and, and increasingly we've gone away from this, but still, our origin story is don't talk to the public, because they're stupid, <laughs> and don't talk to the media, because they'll misquote you, they'll misrepresent you, and they will, and they will, and, but that doesn't make them evil. That makes them just busy folks, right? They have a deadline that's due at five o'clock and they just first saw your wet, they've never been to a wetland before and now you're trying to school them about wetlands and this and that and whatever and they want a sound bite, right? Uh, and, and so that's cool, right? We have to understand those are the constraints. So the onus is on you as the restoration practitioner to think more clearly about what your message is, right? To be able to be succinct, not just to talk to the public that are naive, but in particular to talk to uh, folks in the media that are naive about your particular system. And so if you do have a blog, you can give them your bullet list and then point them to your blog and they can go there for more, more information. If you're fortunate enough to have a reporter that has more time on his or her hands, that is more engaged, you still want to start with those blurbs, those, those highlights, those summary points. But then you'll be able to, you know what, just come on out. We'll spend the day. I'll show you around, tell you this or that, blah, 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 right? So the notion of media as enemy is an incorrect, even though that's a very popular thing right now in our political discourse, that is not the right way forward. For a democracy, that's not the right way forward. That's the right way in Turkey, right? When they want their message to go a certain way, they don't want to talk to the media, they want to do all the talking to the media. Um, so to be sure, not all media are great, not all media are perfect, but that is how we get the word out. So, so the last part of this is not just innovate, but communicate that innovation. And again, this should be throughout. So just like we're talking to the public throughout, we didn't just talk to them and leave them, they're in integrated throughout this process. We should also be, you know, bringing the media along. And again, that's scary, right? When we don't know what we're doing, well, let's wait to the end till we know how everything worked out. No, no. You want them there for when the little kid is planting the tree, right? So the little kid is, wow, this place is cool and it's muddy and it's wah, 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 right? Media there, boom then they're starting to build a relationship, just like the public is building a relationship to this important ecological resource. The media is building a familiarity. And the media can refer to that when they, when they do the, the whatever, five year assessment story, they can refer to when we were breaking ground with the tractors. And they can refer to when we were first planting with the whoever. And they can refer to it the first time we had the new endangered species show up and build a nest, right? And so they will be better at their job. And so, so even though a lot of media are not technical folks, don't come from a scientific background, say that, take a breath, and go forward. Don't, don't try to fight reality. Cool? Okay, so that's my, that's my quick overview uh, as to um, the elements of restoration.